I grew up in Canada, so the Civil War is not part of my heritage. But my wife, Jill, is here this evening. Her great-grandfather, Walter Gosden, served with Colonel Mosby in the 43rd Virginia Cavalry and is buried here in your beautiful Hollywood Cemetery. I gather that service is considered a mark of distinction in this state. And to make the Virginia connection even more special, uh, a few years ago, our son Henry graduated from UVA, where he had the pleasure both of being a Jefferson scholar and the good fortune of meeting his now fiancee, Emma. Emma is from Lynchburg, Virginia, and I'm pleased that her parents, Paul and Paula Feynman, are here this evening. So now on to Winston Churchill and the Civil War. Churchill was born and lived in Britain all of his life, but he knew a tremendous amount about the war and wrote and spoke about it frequently. That interest deeply influenced his understanding of America and the American people. And while the Civil War was but one of Churchill's many interests, it provides an intriguing window into how he thought about history, war, and politics, which were the central preoccupations of his life. So let's start with a story from the governor's mansion here in Richmond, one evening in October 1929. The governor was your legendary Harry F. Byrd Sr. And the occasion was a formal dinner for a distinguished British visitor who had just arrived for a stay with the Byrd family. The governor's then 14-year-old son, Harry Byrd Jr., was standing at the bottom of the mansion's grand staircase with his cousin, waiting to greet the guest of honor when he came from upstairs. The guest bounded down the stairs with scarcely a hello to either of them. Apparently mistaking the cousin for a butler, he said briskly, young man, fetch me a newspaper. The startled reply was, of course, sir. So the two fellows bounded down to the Richmond Hotel a block away and quickly returned with a copy of that day's Richmond News Leader. They were rewarded with a 25 cent tip, which they kept the rest of their lives. That British visitor was, of course, Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill, and he was a demanding guest. As young Bird recalled, Churchill took to specifying the exact time of day he wanted each meal and what he expected on the menu. And apparently he had the habit of wandering around the, muse the uh, mansion's second floor in his underwear. When it was finally time to leave the next morning, the birds stood outside their front door, waving goodbye to their distinguished visitor. Harry Bird Jr. years later recalled, quote, I remember my mother's first words to my father as Churchill's car pulled out of the driveway. Harry, she said, don't you ever invite that man back. <laughs> so what was Winston Churchill, already one of the most famous men in Britain and the world, doing in Virginia? He had lost the position of Chancellor of the Exchequer when the British government in which he served was defeated in that May's general election. But nonetheless, he was busy. A visit to a, what was then a relatively quiet southern state was something unexpected. Churchill was actually on the last stages of a three-month coast-to-coast tour of America. He had come because he recognized the power of America even in the time of isolationism and its importance to the future of the world. He had delivered a raft of paid speeches across the country. In addition to, to sharing his views on world issues, he badly needed the money, and Americans paid handsomely to hear him. So how did Winston Churchill's fascination with the Civil War come about? What did it mean to him, and what did he say about it? Churchill was born into one of Britain's grandest families, the grandson of the seventh Duke of Marlborough. He came to his lifelong interest in war naturally. As an earlier ancestor, the first Duke had famously defeated the forces of King Louis XIV of France at the Battle of Blenheim in Bavaria in 1704. The year of Churchill's birth, 1874, was only nine years after the end of the Civil War, which was a fresh and vivid memory for Churchill's father, Lord Randolph, as well as for everyone in Britain. 
the spectacle of this great English-speaking republic, less than a century old, but now tearing itself apart, was followed with consuming interest. Sentiment in Britain was deeply divided. While slavery had been abolished in the empire in 1833, support for the South was widespread. At various points, friction between Britain and the Union threatened to lead to direct involvement in the conflict on the southern side. Of course, that didn't happen, but what a game changer it might have been. It was natural that Churchill would gravitate to the history of the United States, as his mother was the Brooklyn-born Jenny Jerome, the daughter of a wealthy New York financier, Leonard Jerome. Leonard Jerome was a part owner of the New York Times newspaper, and during that city's vicious draft riots in 1863, he helped to fight off a mob attempting to torch the Times' office. The Times had been targeted because it was well known to be a leading supporter of the Republican Party. I understand that's not the case anymore. <laughs> Churchill grew up in Britain with Punch Magazine cartoons of the Civil War, of which these are just three examples. At age 12 in 1887, he wrote to his mother, quote, my birthday is drawing near, and I should rather like a copy of General Grant's History of the American Civil War. The Civil War was the subject of his entrance examination when he applied to the Royal Military College at Sandhurst three years later. As he learned more about it, he concluded, quote, it was the most interesting of all the wars of which I have read. After graduating from Sandhurst in 1895, Churchill made his first visit to America. There he told his New York host about a fascinating new book that had become popular in Britain, but was yet little read in the United States. It was Stephen Crane's classic, The Red Badge of Courage. Winston Churchill was soon a fast rising star in the House of Commons after his election in 1900, and a few years later entered the cabinet. As military rivalries between Britain, France, and Germany increased, Churchill looked to the Civil War for lessons. He thought that Britain should cultivate a volunteer army, as had the North and South, and that the Civil War provided examples of innovative military technology that could inspire Britain. Churchill ended up a vigorous proponent of two game-changing inventions of the 20th century, the tank and the airplane. In the First World War, Churchill recognized in the trench warfare of the Western Front and the Allied blockade of Germany echoes of the Civil War. He understood that while the Allies, like the North, would emerge victorious, the price of that victory would be written in unprecedented carnage and casualties. Early on in his 1929 visit to America, Churchill had received an invitation to participate in celebrating the anniversary of the surrender of General Cornwallis at nearby Yorktown, Virginia. Not approving of the outcome, he thought it his patriotic duty to decline. But he did very much want to see the Civil War battlefields. He could not have had a better guide than this man, Douglas Southall Freeman, the editor of the Richmond News Leader, the son of a still living Confederate veteran, and a historian then writing what was to be his classic four volume biography of Robert E. Lee. When this Pulitzer Prize winning study was published in the 1930s, Freeman acknowledged his debt to Churchill, saying, quote, he went over the ground with this writer and made many helpful observations. The two men together walked the battlefields of Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Spotsylvania, and the Seven Days. After returning to London, Churchill recorded his impressions in a delightful newspaper article in the Daily Telegraph of December 16, 1929, entitled, Old Battlefields of Virginia. <laughs> 
Churchill began his account by striking a contrast between North and South. He said, it takes only a few hours to go from Washington to Richmond, but we breathe a different air. It is another country. And Churchill continues, we have exchanged the 20th century for the 19th and crossed the mysterious boundary which separates the present from the past. He added, we have entered the domain of history. He painted the scene vividly. We march with Lee and Jackson, with Stuart, Longstreet, and Early, through autumn woodlands, lonely in their leafy splendors of old gold and fading crimson. He added, it is still a broken land. Churchill described the various battlefields and noted, quote, no one can understand what happened merely through reading books. You must see the ground. You must cover the distances in person. You must measure the rivers and see what the swamps were really like. And he saw the war's impact in front of his eyes. Quote, the farmhouses and churches still show the scars of shot and shell. Their woods, the woods are full of trenches and rifle pits. The larger trees are full of bullets. And he added, quote, before the Confederate Museum in Richmond still flies a rebel flag. Perhaps not anymore. Um, Churchill described the area south of the Rappahannock River as one, quote, on which perhaps more soldiers have perished in an equal space than anywhere except Ypres and Verdun. Shortly after his return to England, Churchill wrote another article for a magazine, which he then contributed to a book entitled, If It Had Happened Otherwise. Among the chapters in this exercise in counterfactual history was one entitled, quote, If Booth Had Missed Lincoln. Churchill's choice was a double negative, if Lee had not won the Battle of Gettysburg. At his imaginary Gettysburg, Churchill conjures up Jeb Stuart and his cavalry arriving at the Union rear with powerful effect just as George Pickett begins his famous charge. In Churchill's words, a mass panic disrupts the Union forces and the charge is successful. Churchill himself had been a cavalry officer, so it's not surprising that he made Jeb Stuart one of the heroes. And Churchill continues the story. The Confederates are victorious, and Lee turns south, capturing Washington three days later. The war is over. In, Churchill, in Churchill's fertile imagination, quote, Lee, in a master stroke, then declares the end of slavery, which swings British opinion towards an alliance with the Confederacy. Facing this formidable combination, and with the issue of slavery gone, Lincoln, in September, signs what Churchill called the Peace of Harper's Ferry, giving slaves their freedom, but establishing the South as an independent nation. But Churchill's not finished. Facing the rise of Germany in the early 20th century, President Theodore Roosevelt and British Prime Minister Arthur Balfour meet to consider an alliance. And when the President of the Confederate States, a Virginian named Woodrow Wilson, joins the effort, the three nations sign the Covenant of the English Speaking Association, which adopts international peace and disarmament as its foreign policy. And Churchill continues the story. In 1914, when continental Europe began to mobilize, the English speakers threaten war and the belligerents stand down. Thus, in Churchill's words, World War I, which, quote, might well have led to the loss of many millions of lives, unquote, never came to pass, all because Jeb Stuart arrived in the nick of time and Robert E. Lee did win the Battle of Gettysburg. Perhaps, alas, for the world, all that never happened. In 1932, Churchill signed a contract to write a major work of popular history, which became four volumes entitled A History of the English-Speaking Peoples. In 
wanting to appeal to the large American audience, Churchill knew that the story of the United States, and in particular its Civil War, should be a significant part of the work. Over the next few years, he wrote much of the four volumes, but set them aside in September 1939, when he became, to say the least, very busy. The History of the English-Speaking Peoples was finally published between 1956 and 1958 and became an international bestseller. It was criticized for paying little attention to economic or social history, but it is a beautifully written, fluid, and expressive classic of political and military narrative, and is perhaps the most read and best loved of all of Churchill's works. In its review of the book, the New York Times noted Churchill, quote, has the visual imagination to actually see the events he describes. Most importantly, the work skillfully presents the case for the historic special relationship of the two great English-speaking nations, Britain and America, a phrase which Churchill himself had coined in his famous Iron Curtain speech in Fulton, Missouri. For Churchill, this special relationship was not just military or political, but was grounded in shared values and served as a bulwark of democracy for the world. It's not surprising that these volumes have gone through multiple editions and are still in print today. The fourth and final volume of the history is entitled The Great Democracies, and the Civil War takes up half the space Churchill devotes to the United States in the 19th century. By the summer of 1939, Churchill had finished a detailed draft of the war narrative and wrote the following to a distinguished British historian of the war, Sir James Edmonds, summarizing his overall view of the conflict. Churchill wrote, the Confederates never had any chance at all. It was only a question of the North getting underway and the amount of time to destroy, if necessary, every living soul in the Confederate States. But Churchill added, but how dramatic is the wonderful resistance they made. Interest in Churchill's account of the war was so high that just three years after it was first published in 1958, it came out as a separate volume, still available today, entitled simply, The American Civil War. Not surprisingly, Churchill's view of the war reflected the historiography of the day, in which the South's lost cause stood as a noble, if failed, effort. Churchill saw the origin of the war, both in the struggle over slavery, but also in other differences pitting North against South. Churchill's sympathy for Virginia and his admiration for its greatest son, Robert E. Lee, both as a man and a military leader, is clear. He describes Lee this way, quote, one of the noblest Americans who ever lived and one of the greatest captains known in the annals of war. Churchill had similar admiration for Stonewall Jackson and considers Jackson's partnership with Lee to be, quote, the high point of the conflict. He calls the war, quote, a struggle unsurpassed in history. But Churchill went on to note that by the end of 1863, the South knew that the war was lost, but that, quote, it is one of the enduring glories of the American nation that this made no difference to the Southern resistance. Churchill also acknowledged the accomplishments of Grant and Sherman, albeit in less poetic, poetic terms. He wrote about the war of attrition waged against the Confederate armies and the Union's determination to break the economic infrastructure and morale of the entire South. Leaping a half century forward, Churchill recognized in those elements tactics employed by the Allies in the even greater struggle of the First World War. Not surprisingly, for a man who loved freedom, Churchill's hostility to slavery appears in several places in the book. He described the abolition of slavery in the British Empire in 1807 as one of Britain's greatest achievements and favorably noted 
the searing indictment of slavery in Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. On another occasion, he said, quote, of all the wars that men have fought, none was more noble than the Civil War in America. But all the heroism of the South could not redeem their cause from the stain of slavery. But that said, Churchill, reflecting the thinking of the time, criticized Reconstruction as, quote, a shameful and discreditable episode. You might be wondering what Churchill said about Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln does not dominate Churchill's narrative, but Churchill recognized the president's stature while recording some of his flaws as commander in chief. He speaks of Lincoln's, quote, natural resolution and generosity of character. Churchill went on to note, quote, Lincoln's homely humor stood him in good stead. A sense of irony helped to lighten his burdens. His spirit was sustained by a deepening belief in providence. And Churchill added, when the toll of war rose steeply, Lincoln appealed for strength to a power higher than man's. And Churchill added about Lincoln, quote, at the summit of authority, it is sometimes necessary to bear the intrigues of disloyal colleagues, to remain calm when others panic, and to withstand misguided popular outcries. All this Lincoln did. To me, that sounds like Winston Churchill speaking of himself in the Second World War. Churchill ends the narrative with Appomattox and Lincoln's assassination. Of Lincoln's death, he said, quote, with him vanished the only protector of the prostate South. None but he could control the bitter political hatreds which were rife. Churchill added, the assassin's bullet had wrought more evil to the United States than all the Confederate candidate. If you're interested in learning more about Lincoln and Churchill, there's a wonderful website by our good friend Lou Lerman entitled lincolnandchurchill.org and an accompanying book, Lincoln and Churchill, Statesmen at War. Lou rightly calls Lincoln and Churchill the two greatest statesmen of the English-speaking world, one of the 19th century and one of the 20th. The parallels between the two men's wartime experiences and the challenges they faced are striking. How to create and maintain a successful coalition government. How to deal with military commanders not enthusiastic about fighting. How to communicate with a broad public, both in writing and in inspiring speeches. And how to defeat dangerous ideologies that crushed liberty and human dignity. Churchill finishes his account of the war with this beautiful epitaph. Thus ended the great American Civil War, the <coughs> noblest and least avoidable of all the great conflicts of which there was a record. The genius of America was impoverished by the alienation of many elements in the life of the Republic. But after the smoke of the battlefield had cleared, the horrid shape, he means slavery, which had cast its shadow over the whole continent, had vanished and was gone forever. As the Second World War approached, Churchill reflected on what he had learned from Civil War history. Many in Germany and Japan believed America weak and unwilling to step into a new war and fight. Churchill thought otherwise, later reflecting, quote, some said Americans were soft, they would never stand bloodletting but I had studied the Civil War, fought to the last desperate inch. And as the Second World War progressed, Churchill saw in his American allies echoes of the commanders of the last century, saying, quote, there was about General Lee a quality of selflessness which raised him to the very highest rank of men. And Churchill continued, and in General Marshall and General Eisenhower, that character that quality of selflessness has been a bond uniting the Allied armies and a key to our victory. To Marshall as to Churchill, both Lee and Jackson were heroic figures. Eisenhower too, while not a Southerner, 
had a keen interest in Civil War generals and their campaigns. Years later, retiring to his farm in Gettysburg, he too speculated on what might have happened if the battle had ended differently. In 1959, Winston Churchill made one of his last visits to the United States, which included a three-day stay at the White House. Eisenhower arranged for a helicopter flight up to Gettysburg, where they shared a bird's eye view of the battlefield, and then drove around Ike's farm in a golf cart. <laughs> the end of the Civil War provided Churchill with a classic example of one of his favorite themes, the need for reconciliation in the wake of conflict. After the First World War, he noted it was rare for a victor to secure by generosity what had been gained by force. In his words, quote, those who can win the victory cannot make the peace. Those who make the peace would never have won the victory. Churchill described Grant's conduct at Appomattox as the greatest day of his career and a high point in American history. And he saluted Lincoln's desire for reconciliation with the vanquished. When the Third Reich capitulated at the end of the Second World War, Churchill said of the German people, quote, my hate died with their surrender, and I was much moved by their haggard looks and threadbare clothes. As you know, Abraham Lincoln came here to Richmond on April 4th, 1865, just after its evacuation by Confederate forces. He received a delegation of white Virginians anxious to know what fate awaited their state. They must, Lincoln explained, quote, not love Virginia less, but must love the Republic more. When, and when Churchill wrote his memoirs of the Second World War, each volume began with what he called the moral of the work. It is, in war, resolution, in defeat, defiance, in victory, magnanimity, in peace, goodwill. And Churchill put his knowledge of the Civil War to good use on other occasions. In May 1943, he visited Franklin Roosevelt in Washington, and the president decided to entertain his guest with a road trip to the presidential retreat, Camp Shangri-La, now known, thanks to President Eisenhower, as Camp David. When they passed through the town of Frederick, Maryland, Churchill asked, isn't this where Barbara Fritchie lived? the woman in the poem by John Greenleaf Whittier, the one who stood up to Stonewall Jackson. Pleased with his guest interest, the president said yes and began to recite the poem. Up from the meadows rich with corn, clear in the cool September morn. But then there was an awkward silence because FDR had forgotten the rest of the words. Well, among Winston Churchill's attributes was a near photographic memory and much to his host's surprise, he proceeded to recite the 30 couplets of this poem by heart, including its most famous lines, shoot if you must this old gray head, but spare your country's flag, she said. I think the Roosevelts were very impressed. There might have been some actual liberty with this story because there were no contemporary accounts of when it happened, and Barbara Fitch herself died at age 95 just a few months later. It's not even clear if Stonewall Jackson marched down her street or ordered his men to fire at the Union flag. But the poem, after being published in the Atlantic magazine in October of the following year, became one of the most popular and inspiring works of the Civil War. It was taught to generations of school children, at least in some parts of the United States, for years afterwards. Its canonical fame obviously leapt the Atlantic, and Churchill must have read and memorized it in his own early education. Whittier was a Quaker, and being a pacifist, found it hard to write poetry during a bloody civil war, which could be both patriotic but nonviolent. No wonder that when he heard the story of Barbara Fitchie, he quickly set it to verse as a perfect example of the power of what we would today call passive resistance. By the following year, 1864, the North was war-weary, 
and while it was clear that the South could not win on the battlefield alone, many Northerners hoped for a negotiated settlement. An election loomed in November, and it was by no means clear that Lincoln and the Republican Party would be returned to office. Thus, for Whittier and his fellow Northerners, who were dedicated to the unconditional defeat of the Confederacy, the story of Barbara Fritchie was quite a tonic. Since 1927, a replica of her house has been a local tourist attraction there, and her name has been plastered on souvenirs ranging from Maryland hams to canned vegetables. And last but not least, she was famously parodied in a Rocky and Bullwinkle TV cartoon in the 1960s. How much more famous can you get than that? So let's finish this story about Winston Churchill and the Civil War this way. Eight years after that Maryland incident, in the summer of 1951, Harry Byrd Jr., then a young journalist, visited Churchill in London. The conversation quickly turned to the Civil War, and Byrd Jr. later reported, quote, in 50 minutes, Mr. Churchill told me more about the history of the area in which I had lived all my life than I had ever known. And Byrd continued, his monologue was spontaneous, said with relish, glee, and great enthusiasm. I kept thinking, why do I know so little about these great events? And the Civil War appeared one last time in Winston Churchill's life. On January 30th, 1965, six days after his death, a great state funeral was held at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. Twenty, Twenty-five years before, an iconic photograph of that cathedral rising undamaged above the smoke of German bombs had come to symbolize the will and resilience of Winston Churchill and the British people. Churchill loved popular songs, and one of his favorites was the great Union anthem, Julia Ward Howe's The Battle Hymn of the Republic. He had heard it on New Year's Day 1942, while worshiping at historic Christ Church in Alexandria with Franklin Roosevelt, sitting together in the pew that had been used by George Washington and Robert E. Lee. It was said that Churchill was seen to weep when it was sung, especially as the priest explained that this was the first time his southern congregation had heard music so firmly associated with northern victory. Churchill asked that the hymn be sung at his funeral, saying it would be a tribute to his American mother, and so it was. If you watch the film of that service, which you can find online, you will see many a teary eye, both British and American, when those words and that music play. I think that powerful, quintessentially American anthem was a fitting tribute both to Winston Churchill and to our Civil War. Thank you. Ellie, thank you very much. Lee Pollock, a great talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you everyone for being here tonight. Little change of pace, Winston Churchill in the Civil War, still Civil War related, but another fascinating character from history, the great man himself. I've got two or three easy questions for Lee to, to answer. I haven't seen them before, I promise. <laughs> and then we will open the floor to, to, uh, to you all. I'm sure you've got some great ideas and you will test Lee's knowledge of history. Uh, and Churchill, so Churchill's a fascinating figure, fascinating historical figure for a host of reasons. One of those reasons is of course he's, he wears many hats in his long career and Churchill lives a long life. Um, artist, statesman, uh, author and soldier. Lee referenced the fact that, that Churchill's a cavalry officer. He's in the front of one of the last great charges of the British, cavalry charge of the British Army at the Battle of Omdurman. So Churchill has seen combat uh, in the most tactical sense. Um, Churchill endeavored also, as Lee demonstrated very well, to learn history, but not only learn history, but to learn from history and an institution dedicated to the public understanding of the Civil War, it's appropriate, I think, that we think about how it was that, that Winston Churchill 
throughout his whole life thought about what happened, but also why, and what we can take away. So my question really, Lee, for you is, where did this come from for Winston Churchill? I think for Churchill, history was something that he lived and breathed. It wasn't, um, Jack Plum, a great Cambridge historian, said many years ago, history was not something that Winston Churchill studied like geography or science. It was really embedded into his entire being. It was, he, thought, he knew he was making history and that you know, Im embedded the sense of history in him. It goes back, obviously, to his great ancestor, the first Duke of Marlborough. Churchill in the 1930s wrote an epic biography of the first Duke. Um, history was you know, something deeply steeped in his family. Um, they had lived in Blenheim Palace since the early 1700s. So it was for Churchill something profound. Um, he, as I said, he recognized he was you know, going to be a historic figure himself. He, there were all kinds of wonderful quotes of what he said about history, um, slightly paraphrasing, the farther you look back, the farther forward you can see. And uh, so for him, history was really something embedded in his personality. And he, in addition to making history, was determined to write about and document it, especially if he could play the starring role, which was always his ambition in life. Uh, Winston Churchill famously uh, once said that history shall be kind to me, for I intend to write that history. And of course, in his magisterial six-volume history of World War II, Churchill did indeed write that history, and indeed it was very kind to Winston Churchill. Would you say, Lee, that our perception of Winston Churchill, and as Lee also mentioned, next year, uh, 2024, will be the 150th anniversary of Winston Churchill's birth, um, is our perception of Churchill today grounded very much on the history that Churchill wrote in which, in which he was the heroic figure? I think a lot of the popular perception is, is based on that. Um, at the end of the Second World War, um, Germany surrendered in May 1945. There was a British election in um, July, and shockingly, the uh, Churchill and the Conservative Party were turfed out of office in a massive landslide for the Labour Party. His wife, Clementine, who had hoped he would retire um, at the end of the war, said to him, my dear, this is a blessing in disguise. And he replied, my dear, at the moment it seems quite effectively disguised. So, so he, he nursed his wounds, but one of the things he did was to, uh, when he left Number 10 Downing Street, Street, was to take a lot of the files with him. And he had, because of that, a, you know, a resource of um, documents and information unavailable to anyone else, so he immediately set himself to writing, which, as Rob said, is an epic six-volume biography called The Second World War. It was also the thing that finally put him at financial ease. Um, Life magazine bought the uh, serial rights in the US. It was a global bestseller translated into multiple languages. Um, and you know, certainly for the next 20 years, our perception of Churchill was based on the narrative that he himself created. Uh, he once said about, he, it was, he was obviously accused of being very biased and self-centered, and he admitted as such, he once said, this is not history, this is my case. And, and so it was. The, the pendulum of histor historiography swings back and forth, and Churchill is such a fascinating figure to think about because he is such a, you know, an iconic figure in, in modern history, how people have interpreted him differently and we're at a stage now in, in history, which we see in the United States, where um, for, for many reasons, some good, perhaps some less so, people are thinking about history differently. And particularly in Britain, this has become you know, a, a real controversial issue and question. People ask me sometimes, is Churchill more admired in Britain or in the United States? And I say, well, in the United States for sure, because the Churchill we know, by and large, is the great heroic Churchill of 1940 on, um, and that's the perception that we have of him crafted in his own, in his own narrative. Um, Americans are less likely to appreciate that when he became prime minister in May 1940, he had 40 years of domestic political baggage in the UK, and he'd been wrong about a great many things. Um, his great virtue was to be right about the most important thing at the most important time. And in, you know, in today's world, issues of um, Empire, uh, colonialism, race um, are issues that um, historians and the broad public uh, didn't pay as much attention to. Now, Churchill has been unfairly tarred 
um, accused of being a racist, which he wasn't, and accused of, um, you know, of lots of other, other sins. Um, he made a lot of mistakes about a lot of things. Um, you know, he, he once said to his wife Clementine, if I had not made mistakes, I would not have accomplished anything. Um, and he was able to learn from his mistakes. He went on to make different mistakes, as people do. Um, so that pendulum right now of history has gone back and forth. Um, 10 or 20 years ago, he was you know, everyone's choice in Britain for the greatest Britain of all time. There's now you know, more dissent about that. That pendulum will perhaps swing back. Um, and there's, you know, the amount of information about Churchill is so enormous. He will always be a fascinating um, figure. People ask me, you know, why, why has someone written another book about Winston Churchill? And I say, for the same reason every year there's a book about Lincoln, about Washington, about Napoleon. Great iconic figures of history are always going to command our attention, even as our interpretation mm -hmm. will swing <coughs> back and forth. I said at the beginning that, as you all know, Churchill wears many hats in his, in his long life. Um, and I would say personally that Churchill I is a man not just for, for his time, but for all time. But would you say, Lee, that Churchill's times were uniquely predisposed to create a man like Winston Churchill? And if they were not, where are our Churchills today? Um, in, uh, some years ago, a British historian named Robert Rowe James wrote a, an excellent book about Churchill up until 1939. And, um, when he was still uh, out of office in his wilderness years. And the title of the book was Winston Churchill, A Study in Failure. And I'd like to say if that had been published in 1939, most people would have thought it to be um, an appropriate title. He was 65. He'd been out of office for a decade. He'd been wrong about lots of things, even recently. Um, but you know, as that phrase goes, you know, the hour maketh the man. And, um, Churchill was uniquely positioned in May of 1940 at what, literally within a matter of days, became an existential turning point in global history. Um, he was you know, the person for that time and place. Um, people sometimes ask me, what, what, what's interesting about Churchill and what lesson or example does he provide? And I like to say that he, he demonstrates that leadership can make a difference and that um, history of the world aren't just broad economic and social forces, and that one person in particular can make a difference in history. And if that person makes a difference at a unique inflection point in the world, as Churchill did in 1940, you know, that's something that we can learn from and will be, to, to me and I think other people, always interesting and mm -hmm. fascinating. Good answer, Lee. Ladies and gentlemen, questions from the floor. And we, we take questions about anything to do with Winston Churchill, not just, uh, not just the Civil War. With studying um, uh, so many different battles and everything, uh, I know it starts with a G, I can't remember the name, but the big, his very first big blunder of uh, trying to invade Turkey during yeah. Gallipoli. Gallipoli and the Dardanelles, right. The, uh, do you know if he found any solace in previous uh, military leaders having coming back from massive failures, or was there any particular one that he pointed to to try to soothe himself to bring himself back up? Well, he, he was certainly devastated by being forced out of the cabinet um, after the, the failure of the Dardanelles campaign. Um, there's an excellent book by a Canadian historian, Christopher Bell, called Church from the Dardanelles, if you want to read more about that. Um, and <coughs> one way he um, got himself back on his feet was to rejoin um, one of the British regiments and go to the front in Flanders. Um, you know, it would be as if Donald Rumsfeld during the Iraq War had uh, resigned as Secretary of Defense and gone off and joined a military unit. Um, I can't say specifically that he looked at some previous figure of history who had been knocked down and, and gotten back up um, as, he, as he was able to do. Churchill was a great admirer of Napoleon, you know, which you can argue was a good or bad thing. Now, Napoleon, of course, was knocked down and never got back up after, after Waterloo. Um, and um, certainly Churchill drew inspiration from the first Duke of Marlborough in terms of how he could develop military strategy. Um, People sometimes say to me, Winston Churchill won the Second World War. 
I say, well, he really didn't. That was won by, won by um, you know, Russian manpower and American force of arms. The great accomplishment of Winston Churchill was not to lose the Second World mm -hmm. War at a time when that, that could have happened. So t in today's politics, if a person age 65 uh, has, has this history of failures, uh, stumbles along the way, they're basically put out the pasture. Did, did Churchill think of his failures? He apparently was able to put them aside and address the issue of the day. Is that basically, I mean, he didn't dwell on yeah. the history so much as, this is what I have to do yeah. now, this is my moment. Yeah. He, um, he certainly was resilient. Um, one question we often asked is, you know, was, was Churchill, you know, you know manic depressive? He, there was some writing in the past of what he called the black dog of depression, which sounds like a much more ominous thing than it actually is. But he was a, he was a resilient person, um, personally. And you know, he, uh, one of the talks I uh, give is called Churchill, God, and Destiny. It's about this tremendous sense of destiny that he had. And you know, in the 1930s, when he was out of office, scorned by most people in the Conservative Party, um, he did have that sense of, um, of resilience and a belief um, in himself. He said to his mother when he was a young man, you know, I have a star and I'm meant to do something in this world. Um, and then, you know, you know, as soon as the war broke out, he comes back in government and um, barely nine months later, at this tremendous turning point in the world, he com comes back into power. So he did have, he did have a, a great deal of personal resilience, which was tested when you make a list of all the things that he was wrong about and criticized for um, you know, almost all his life. It's a, it's a long list. And he was able to power himself through that. Um, you, can, you can ask whether the alcohol helped or didn't, but that's, another, that's, a, that's a different talk. Tara. Churchill write at all about his thoughts on the military strategy of the American Revolutionary War? Um, the history of English speak being peoples has a fair amount about um, the revolution. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm not don't terribly familiar. Yeah, I, don't, I don't recall anything really specific about the strategic aspects of that. Um, Churchill was descended on his mother's side from a Revolutionary War officer, which he was very proud of. Um, there was also a family legend that um, they were also descended from an Iroquois Indian, which apparently was not true. Um, and in 1954, Churchill became a member of the Society of the Cincinnati, which is an organization I think most of you know about. And he was extremely proud of that. And um, you know, he famously said in, when he made his great speech to the Joint Session of Congress in December, December 26, 1941, after just coming to Washington after Pearl Harbor, he began by saying, um, if my father had been American and my mother British, instead of the other way around, I might have got here on my own. Yeah, so he would have, he would have been um, you know, a great American politician. Um, how he would fare on Twitter is another, or X as it's called, another story. Um, and um, I, I sometimes joke that if I you know, put a sandwich board on my back that said, um, yeah, where is Churchill when we need him, I could parade up and down in front of the US Capitol and have hundreds of people every hour come and shake my hand and, and ask, that, ask that question. And, um, his, history is full of, uh, recent history especially, full of um, public figures who um, liken themselves to Churchill. Boris Johnson um, was uh, inclined to do that and even wrote a book called The Churchill Factor. Um, being compared to Churchill is a, is a tricky thing and I'm not sure as a, a political figure how much I would, um, I would attempt to, um, yeah, to wrap myself in Churchillian armor. What were his techniques as a historian? Um, he organized file cards. Four by six with cuttings and, and, and random notes. Also, did he see history as an exercise in explaining and challenging uh, conventional wisdom or ennobling figures in history? In, in terms of the first question, um, he. Um, it goes, goes, goes without saying the church did not type himself, and he didn't, he didn't write out. Um, his um, works of history. There's something like 15 million words he wrote over the years. So he would dictate to one or two secretaries. Um, his Second World War books are just full and full of documents, which he collected when he left number 10. Some people criticize them for being uh, 
you know, lots of documents and not enough, enough narrative. I don't know about using index cards um, in terms I, of... What, I, what I'm not sure. The, there was a great book by Professor David Reynolds at, who was at Cambridge called Winston S. Churchill Fighting and Writing the Second World War. And it looks at Churchill's process in the writing of those six volumes. And he takes apart um, with a sort of forensic intensity the various drafts of all of those six volumes because they all, they all survive in the Churchill College, Ar Churchill College archives. What Churchill has in, in some of the earlier drafts and what he doesn't have in at the end is a fascinating sort of exposition of that process. That, well worth a read. That's, that. a, that's a wonderful book. And in the, uh, the, the Second World War series of books came out, I think, in 1948 and 53. And he pulled his punches about the United States. Um, he was very cautious about overemphasizing the disagreements with Roosevelt and the American generals because he wanted to come back to power himself and he knew in a changed you know, global world order, mm -hmm. um, you know, er airing your, your dirty laundry about all the issues and problems between the um, British and American allies wasn't something he, um, he wanted to do. Um, and I, my, his history is sort of classic narrative, political and military history. Um, I, I don't think you could call it iconoclastic or, um, or revisionist. Um, you know, it's, it's fairly conventional. Um, in addition to the Second World War, after the First World War, he wrote another enormous six volumes called The World Crisis, also attempting to present his case for his role during the war. And um, someone, I, I think it was Arthur Balfour or, or someone who, uh, who read the books, sniffed and said, Winston has written a big book about himself and called it the world crisis. So, so everything Churchill wrote was about himself, um, you know, you know, mostly the, um, you know, the better parts of his, um, his life and story. I, I think just, just on that note about what is history, Churchill knew better than most historians or, or better than most people that history is not the past. History is essentially our best effort to reconstruct the past based on the evidence that remains. And Churchill was very keenly aware that that offers opportunities. Um, and you can see that in, in, both, of the, in the, both of those works. I had a question over here, sir. Yes, uh, two really. First one, what do you think was Churchill's greatest victory? And the second one, what about Gallipoli? Do you think he's unfairly blamed for that, or is it a fair blame? Why didn't you answer those two first, and then I'll, answer, I'll give you my thoughts well, too. Well, certainly his greatest achievement was what happened between May 10th, 1940, and say, um, June 22nd, 1941, when the Germans invaded the Soviet Union, and December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. And as I said, it was not to, to win the Second World War, it was not, it was not to lose it. Um, so I would say that. Um, Churchill and the Dardanelles is a, is a controversial, thorny subject. Um, well into the 1920s or even 1930s, when he would go out and give a speech, some um, you know, wise guy in the audience you know, would jump up and say, what about the Dardanelles? And that was a, a millstone around his neck. Um, I like to say it was his fault, but not only his fault. And Christopher Bell's book, Church from the Dardanelles, it, I think present, presents a very balanced um, you know, overview of this. It was a, an idea that had it worked, might have really accomplished a lot of important strategic things. You can say that about a lot of ideas. Had they, they would have been great ideas had they worked. And um, whether you, know, you could argue about whether you know, more troops and a more effective um, um, Allied landing might have pushed the Turks back. But it was a, it was a series of problems from the get-go and a couple hundred thousand casualties and a very, um, you know, very much a, a setback for Britain and, and France at the time. I, I think undoubtedly, as Lee suggests, Churchill's literal finest hour is, is um, in ensuring that the British continue to resist when any objective assessment of the British position said, make a peace with the Germans. Hitler had said, had expressed admiration for the British Empire and for Churchill and didn't allegedly want to get involved with the British. Churchill could have made a peace but he chose not to. JFK famously said, Churchill mobilized the English language and sent it into battle. For that, we all owe Churchill a debt of gratitude because had the British not resisted long enough for the US to enter and for the, for the, uh, for the for Russians to make a difference, then Hitler would have been unassailed. Um, as for the Dardanelles, I think 
So the Allies land April 20, 25th, 1915. The casualty figures on the Western Front are not yet at the British Army on the 1st of July 1916, suffers 60,000 casualties in 12 hours. 12 hours, of which 20,000 are dead and 40,000 wounded. The casualty figures in 15 are nowhere near that, but Churchill even then knows that the stalemate is going to remain an incredible stalemate. So Churchill's looking at the map and saying, is there a way, is there a peripheral strategy? It's a big ask. The Turks are no pushover. It's a very big ask to try and land in the Dardanelles and put pressure on the Ottomans that will divert the Germans. But Churchill is thinking, as we would say today, outside the box. Is there anything we can do to avoid this stalemate? So for that, he deserves credit. And as Lee rightly says, on the ground, there is poor coordination between the Navy and the troops being landed and inability to neutralize Turkish forts and get to the best landing beaches. Churchill called the Western Front stalemate chewing on barbed wire, which yeah. is a wonderful phrase. He wanted to think of something, something to do about right. that. On the first question, um, Churchill was asked later in life if he could go back to any time in his life and relive it, what would that be? And he replied in a flash, you know, 1940, you know, all over again, any time. He recognized that was his finest hour as the world recognized you know, I afterwards. I am holding the cabinet together when he first became prime minister was what saved the world. I mean, he kept England in it, and as you well know, he was disfavored. He came in as prime minister, and probably three of the other five people in the war cabinet were against him. And his manipulation of that to stay as prime minister to me led to every success there. The Darkest Hour movie of a few years ago that Gary Oldman won the Academy Award for is all about that period of a few weeks. It's got theatrical flourishes. Um, Churchill never rode on the London Underground despite, yeah. <laughs> despite that movie scene. But it's a, it's a good, um, somewhat dramatized presentation of that critical point. If you want to pick critical points in world history that change the world, or didn't change the world, those few months certainly fall in that category. Walter? As a <coughs> little historical fantasy, like, like, uh, Church, uh, like Churchill did, Churchill's a privileged aristocrat. Place him in the antebellum South, and tell me, would he have been a rebel? I guess maybe is not a good answer. <laughs> That's a good question, Walter. Had he been uh, born in Virginia, or uh, yeah, okay? Born in Virginia, okay. Same privileged yeah. aristocrat, yeah. same history, family history, yeah. uh, and uh, don't even make his uh, his wealth uh, tied yeah. to yeah. the slavery. Yeah. What? How do you see he would have seen the relatively new Union because it wasn't the, the long stretch yeah. of history that England was versus what happened? I guess in those circumstances, um, I could sort of see him as you know, being a proud Virginian and maybe seeing um, the North as so overwhelming and dominating that the South needed to go in a different, co different course. Um, it's an interesting question um, if Churchill, you know, uh, Mary Soames, Churchill's granddaughter, whenever any one of us said, you know, what Winston would have done, she glared at us and said, how do you know what my papa would have done? So we, that she shut us up pretty quickly. Um, it's an interesting question if Churchill was around today writing another history of the Civil War, would, how much would he have changed? Um, you know, his his um, admiration for the you know, nobility and military genius of Robert E. Lee doesn't, <laughs> doesn't play as well today as it did when he was writing it in the 1930s. So how would he change his writing of that history today would be an interesting, interesting question. It, it's hard to know what Churchill thought about what he thought and when he knew it. So if he was a 20-year-old coming out of Sandhurst without well-developed ideas about the world that we know that he had, such as distaste for slavery and all the rest of it, he was, he was a product of his time and, and, and very much an archetype of that. So if he was an archetype and product of Virginia at the time of the Civil War, it's probable he would have, he would have rallied to his state's call, yeah. I would have thought. Yeah. I mean, but, but I, would, I would say, in this 
references back to what I, I mentioned in, in my talk, at the end of the war, I think he would have embraced reconciliation, magnanimity, whether on the victorious side or on the defeated side. Yes, sir. How did he get to know so much about the Civil War? Was it something he would have studied at, at part of the military training, or is it something, you know, what would he have? Churchill had a remarkably fertile and creative <coughs> mind, and uh, as I said, a, a almost photographic memory. Um, I don't know what, you, you taught at Sandhurst for a while. Did you, did you teach about the American Civil War when you were teaching at Sandhurst? Um, Not a lot recently, yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, Perhaps, <laughs> yeah, again, he, he was at Sandhurst um, in the early 1890s, you know, barely you know, 30 years after the end of the war. The war was a living, a living presence. Um, and um, we, we should go back and find the, um, the curriculum books for Sandhurst in the 1890s. Well, uh, as, as, Lee, as Lee said, Church requests uh, Grant's history of the Civil War as a young boy. Um, and when Churchill, his first posting as a subaltern junior officer with the Fourth Hussars is to India, and there's an awful lot of spare time on their hands as a, a junior officer in the British Army in India, there's a comment in one of his best, uh, one of Churchill's best books called My Early Life, how his brother officers would be out, and Churchill's, Churchill's a big polo player, but they'd be out carousing and messing around or, or sleeping off the night before, and Churchill would studiously read the great works of history because he felt certainly early on that he his educate he didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge um, he felt that with an eye on the future as a politician he would be competing against men and it was men in those days who had gone to Oxford or Cambridge had a tremendous classical education he needed to make up that dis difference and that gap on his own so he took the opportunity in India to read the great works of philosophy and history. So Tur Churchill, in the sense, is a self-made man in that self respect. Self-taught, totally. Yeah, self-taught. And, and the Civil War was such an explosive, incredible experience, even for the Brits who, who weren't directly involved in it. I mean, this, the scale of, of, of war, obviously, we know from a museum like this, was just earth-shattering. It was, you know, other than maybe the Crimean War to a l much lesser extent, it was the first modernized right. industrial warfare and really set the stage for much, you know, worse, you know, war, wars of the, um, the 20th century. I think Churchill once said that the, um, the wars of nations will be far more deadly than the wars of kings. And that started with the Civil War and continued um, yeah, yeah, into, the, into, the into the 20th century. I, I would answer your question. How could anyone not be interested in the Civil War when you, you know, then 30 years later or today 150 years later? Uh, and certainly, as you know, the British Army has observers on both sides in the Civil War. And the British Army is paying attention to how battles are won, how they're fought. British Army knows well that civil war is the first manifestation of the full impact of industrialization on warfare. And what's played out in the United States in between 1861 and 1865 is played out on a whole larger scale, but essentially very similarly between 1914 and 1918. So the British Army always endeavors to look back as well as they look forward. So that's certainly, certainly in their mind. We've probably got time for one more question, if there is one more question. Yes? Do you think Churchill would have carried out Operation Unthinkable? Uh, the, the, the background of that is that um, at the end of the war, Churchill had become increasingly frustrated with Stalin's um, obstructionism and came to realize that Stalin and the Soviets intended to dominate all of Eastern Europe, which was not what was you know, Churchill's understanding. So in a fit of, um, of anger, and he was, he was prone to this, he instructed the British general staff, I think it was maybe July 1945, to develop a plan for attacking the Soviet Union with an alliance with the United States and, if necessary, with German troops. It was called Operation Unth Unthinkable. And when he asked the, the military you know, general staff to create this plan, they thought it was bonkers, at which he was, and they were able to you know, cook up a, a, a report in short order which demonstrated that this was absolutely <coughs> impossible. Um, you know, would, would he have actually um, you know, proceeded down that road had they said, you know, or, or if Harry Truman had said, let's, let's go to war against Russia? Prob probably not. The, the irony of that is that in the 1950s when Churchill comes back for his second term as prime minister, much diminished in a lot of ways, um, and Eisenhower is in the White House, and they overlap for about uh, three years, Churchill becomes a vigorous proponent of 
an early version of detente with, with Soviet Russia, especially after the death of Stalin in March 1953, and um, hits a roadblock with Ike and especially with the Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, who were not keen to have, the Churchill coined a phrase, we should have a meeting at the summit, and he wanted a tri-party meeting of himself, the new Russian leaders, and Eisenhower. And Eisenhower didn't want anything to do with this, so there's a certain irony in, in Churchill having been in many ways a man of war for his entire life in his last few years becomes almost obsessed with the threat of th thermonuclear weapons and so concerned about the ability of the world to destroy itself. This becomes his last great, you know, un unrealized cause. Um, John Foster Dulles was um, someone that Churchill <laughs> found extremely difficult. He, um, he, he supposedly said of Dulles, um, the only man he knows, the only bu bull he knows who carries his own china shop around with him. He, he didn't say that, but he did refer to him as Dull Duller Dulles. So they, they, they did not get along, <laughs> to say the least. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming this evening. Lee Pollock, thank you for a fascinating exposition.